Romeo. I want to thank you for coming this morning. I know that uh, the time had been changed and perhaps we have made other plans. We are delighted to have today with us Dr. Julie Young from the Department of uh, Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. She will talk to us as the distinguished uh, Sir Grokin speaker on large scale wind marine turbines state of the art and current champions. As we know, energy probably will define the 21st century. And I think we are looking to generate some, and I think that Dr. Young will talk about some of the options that are increasing, increasingly uh, being considered as we move forward as the politicians say in Washington, D.C. A little bit of uh, information concerning Dr. Young. She got her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in 2002 as an engineer. And she started her academic career at Princeton, yeah, is the department of civil engineering. And given the fact that the department was reorganizing and had the directions that I believe we were talking about to what she wanted to do with her career, she decided to move to the University of Michigan in our Please welcome her. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, and it is a great honor to be here. So, I would actually like to start the presentation by showing you why we need to look at talking a little bit about the energy market and why we want to look at renewables. So, if you just want to take a quick look at the data, basically the there, was, there will be a projected increase of 49% from 2007 to 2035 in terms of the energy use, the worldwide energy consumption. And so that's at a rate of 1.4% per year. And the, because of the increased consumption, we also need to more, have more options in, in terms of the energy sources. Um, in terms of liquids, the, the fields that you're all, we're all used to, the rate of that is about an increase of 0.9% per year. So it's much slower than the demand, energy demand of 1.4%. The good news about that is on the renewable side, we we'll have an increase of about 2.6%. And that's from the recent international energy outlook. So you may want to ask why renewable? So if you look at this slide over here, on the left hand side, this is the oil price, right? So if actually this this data is from 2011. You can see the sharp drop over here because of the collapse of the, um, uh, the economy around 2008. And what you see is that the price, it is rising, and it's very volatile. Depends on what is the geopolitical situation. You can be here. Chances are we're probably not going to be here, but somewhere. And you can be as high as this. You can see that the deviation is in the order of $150 per year. Very high. And at the same time, so this causes the, the, we need to have renewable to combat the oil, increases in oil price and exposure to the market volatility. And from the government perspective, it's also very important to address this issue in terms of national security. So if you think about every dollar, the, for example, if you go to the Naval Science and Technology Conference, every dollar at the barrel, at your gas station, to them is $13, simply because in between the transportation, you have to worry about the safety of the people and then all the associated costs with it. So this is a huge issue. And also we need to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. So this is in terms of year, of course, this is at a very different scale from zero to 2000. And you can see this rapid rise in greenhouse gas emission. And a recent study by the National Research Council of the National Academy of Engineers, um, National Academy, is that non climate change damages caused by coal fired power plants cost us $62 billion per year. But what that means is 3.2 cents per kilowatt hour. So, just some interesting statistics to start the conversation. Um, so, I would like to give first an overview of what I will be talking about today. Um, I would first, because I think people, every, most people are more familiar with wind energy, but the ocean is also a large resource. 70% of our planet is covered by water. I would like to give you some introduction about what are some possible renewable ocean energy resources, including waves and ocean currents, and etc. Then I'll talk about large-scale horizontal access turbines, which are used for 
for basically wind turbines and it can also be used for marine energy uh, or current energy extraction. So in this part, I'll focus on what are the differences between a wind turbine and a marine turbine? How do we analyze and design these turbines? And what are some current opportunities and challenges? So first with the introduction of wave energy, um, the, it's the force changes every 4 to 20 seconds, driven by wind primarily, and you can predict it up to days in, uh, ahead. And so compared to wind, it's a, it, it depends on the situation, it can be more predictable. And you have a whole range of resources. The difficulty is, you know, there are various projections in terms of what is the global electricity potential, but of course not all of it can be realized because of siting restrictions, permits, and logistics issues. So some of the possible um, uh, ocean energy or intercooled wave energy device include the Sea Dragon here on the left. The concept is it just accumulates all the water here, and then basically once it uh, exceeds a particular threshold, you open up this valve, and then you turn it turns a turbine. Um, and on your right hand side is so-called a Palamas. It's a sea snake. So basically, when the wave goes by, this is in about the direction of wave propagation. From the differential heave and pitch motion, you accumulate energy. And you can see that the size of the thing is really not small. In addition, there are a lot of concepts like um, a buoy key type of device. For example, you have the power buoy over here, and then you have the aqua buoy over there. Um, actually, this one, um, they, they, they put it out in, um, in Oregon, and the first trial uh, they, there was failure mainly because when you think about the design of this, it's not just putting the buoy there because you have a power takeoff system, right? But in addition to that, you have to move. And the addition of the mooring lines um, causes, uh, it changes the resonance frequency of the system. In addition, when you design this, you can design it, your wave field changes dramatically over the year between the winter and between the summer. And when you design for it, it's what happened was actually the wave was bigger than what they designed for, and it exceeded the threshold, it popped up and never came back down. Okay. So in a lot of these designs, what, what we, and that would be the point that I would try to make for turbines, is you need to consider the lifetime of possible range of operating conditions that you design for. So other systems that have been proposed, this one is it's a little bit harder, is looking at ocean current. And so because you have deep and, and um, more surface currents, and, and basically you want to think of it's a constant stream, unidirectional Gulf stream uh, with relatively good uh, current velocity that you can take advantage of. Of course, it's not easy to harvest this energy because of the depth. Um, other ones include river current energy. Okay, so this is governed by precipitation. It's stochastic in nature. The problem with it is you have large sediment loads because all the sand can basically blast out on your plates and, and then also all your other components. Um, so, and also you may be subject to degrees and ice impact. Um, and it's difficult to schedule maintenance, etc. And But the advantage of this type of system is that the flow goes in one direction only. So you don't have to worry about bi-directional flow. Um, and the primary type of system is basically a turbine. So you can look at this, it looks pretty much a wind turbine. It's a shorter exception. Um, so another good option um, is tidal energy. And the reason why tidal energy is attractive mainly is because it's very predictable. You can predict it up to hundreds of years ahead in compared to solar or wind or wave and etc. Because it's basically governed by the Earth's rotation, the moon, the gravitational um, acceleration of the, of the moon and the Earth and the sun. So um, the typical device is again thermal. So you can look at the global um, tidal resource potential. Of course, when you talk about tidal or any type of ocean um, harvesting, um, energy harvesting device, they only make sense if you're in the coastal region. But you also have a large percentage of the community in the coastal region. So if you can have the underwater cables, you can do that. So next I'm going to talk in particular about the various types of current energy conversion devices because it can be wind current, it can be wa uh, uh, water current, etc. So the primary ones are horizontal axis turbines, 
So that's the one that these are the various uh, uh, possibilities that has been proposed. Basically, you can borrow. The advantage of that is there is a lot of crossover from wind energy, right? And there's also actually crossover from marine propulsion, and that's my background. Um, and it's self-starting mostly, and it's more efficient. If you look at the efficiency per um, area, the, the, the power density is much higher than the other, right? And that's why they tend to be the most common, right? And it can be supported on the top or bottom. The disadvantage of that is you tip, particularly for bidirectional flow. You need some kind of pitch change mechanism or some kind of yaw change mechanism so that you can adjust, change the direction of flow. So other type that you may have seen, um, if you go to the Detroit airport, you may see one of these. Okay, so this is so-called vertical axis turbine. The advantage of it is omnidirectional. It doesn't matter which direction the wave comes. But, and the other advantage is you can mount it on the top or bottom. For ocean energy, it may make sense because you can mount it just on the top so that you don't need a huge pile. So you have to think about the system as a whole, but the problem is typically it's not self-starting. And the efficiency is much, much lower, um, particularly for these drag type devices, period. Um, there are also a whole bunch of options. Um, if you look at Scientific America, for example, you see the tuna, um, you see some uh, whole bunch of, a lot of concepts are based on lift or flutter type concepts. <coughs> but of course, you can extract energy from here, but you also need to keep it stabilized. Because if not, if a particular current, strong current comes over, all your million dollars goes down the drain, it's not effective. Um, you also have, this is actually from University of Michigan. So this is from Microdesis, and it's so-called Vivachi. Basically, the idea is very neat. It takes advantage of uh, vortex-induced vibration. So normally when flow goes over, flow over a circular column, it generates lift, and because of the separation, the difference in separation between the uh, top and bottom surface that creates a weight and that has a particular frequency so you can take advantage of that frequency, lock it in, and you can harvest energy from this. Traditionally, uh, for example, in the oil industry, on small platforms, you want to avoid this because that creates excessive motion, but you can also take advantage of it. So there is a prototype, if you come to Michigan, he can give you a tour and you can see the whole thing but, um, moving up and down. So there's a whole range of devices, and the thing is, ocean energy is just really a baby, so it's just coming into the field. That also means there's a huge learning curve, but also means there's a huge potential, right? So in terms of research. And just to keep in mind, it typically takes about five to 10 years for a concept to mature, to go into commercial applications. So just to give you a sense, in terms of wind energy, two decades ago, the cost of the electricity was about, for wind energy, was about 20 cents per kilowatt hour, and today it's about 4.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So marine or tidal energy is coming to the market, but um, at a lower initial cost of electricity, um, largely because you can use the technology from wind um, turbines, but there is also a significant crossover. Um, I'm coming from, I designed marine propellers for a long time, and there's a lot that we can contribute, and I'll explain a lot. So, nuclear energy. From the, the, I have, uh, the nuclear energy, I believe, it, don't quote me on this, um, nuclear energy, the, the cost, I think, is around 90 cents per kilowatt hour. I believe, but I, 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 I'm not positive about this. So it's more than 90 cents per kilowatt hour. Yes, it's, uh, but at the same time, it's all your initial investment in how long. So it, the life cycle cost may be very different. So I want to explain what are the differences between a wind and a marine turbine. On the left hand side is a wind turbine, on the right hand side is a water turbine. So first of all, you can see that they look very similar. Okay. Um, so just on the, if, if you think about the differences in performance and you may wonder why, ask why you put it in water. The difference in fluid density is about 840 times. Okay? So, right, air and water. So even in wind, typically in, in this is for a land-based wind turbine, the wind velocity, let's say, is somewhere around 10 to 15 meters per second. In the water, let's say you have currents somewhere around 1.5 to 2.5 meters per second. Now, if I take 
a turbine, exactly the same turbine between in water and put it in air, with a, so you have the same power coefficient, you can see that the power density is about three to four times larger in water, simply because the density is larger. So what that also means is you can use a smaller turbine. So instead of having a 50 meter diameter, you can have a 25 meter diameter, and it will give you exactly the same power. Additionally, you don't have all the noise issues because it's underwater, so you don't have all the people complaining. Yes? The difference in density they found is the difference in diameter is two. Why is that? Um, that's simply because of the velocity, because the power is a function of velocity Q, and the velocity is slower. Because the velocity in water, you're not going to get 50 meters per second. So the velocity has a huge impact. Um, so, because the, the power here is that you want to have rho BQ times the power coefficient. So this is constant, so this dominates. So, constant, but you do have, you, you can extract more energy for a smaller turbine, but the problem is the drag or the thrust, what, the negative of the thrust, whatever you call it, is also three to four times large. That means that's why one of the significant problems of putting a marine turbine is how do you hold it? So I want to show you some successful, uh, some cases that is, is actually um, have already been connected to the grid. So CGen is one of them is by marine current turbines. This is the first commercial scale hydro turbine, right? It was installed in April of 2008 and it was connected to the grid in July. It generates 1.2 megawatts of energy between 18 um, to um, one point, between 18 to 20 hours per day. And you can see over here that it's very large, it's 16 meters in diameter. And you have, this is composite, and this is the steel uh, pile, the foundation, moment pole foundation is three meters in diameter. It's, the nice thing about this one is actually it's a very, it's a, it's, you have two of these turbines over here, rotors, and then they can be adjusted, change in pitch like this, okay? And another very unique thing about the design, and this becomes critical, is that they have the mechanicalized lift legs so that it can be raised it up and the, and you can maintain it, you can clean off the marine growth and then you can put it back down. And they even have specialized vessel that was designed to purposely go out to install these and to clean these to maintain. It's very important they, um, because in the, I'll show at the end of the slide, end of the lecture, that um, you have the maintenance cost is very expensive. So you can see the installation cost is about 3 million pounds per megawatt versus offshore wind turbine is about 2.3 million um, pounds per megawatt for offshore. So just a sense of comparison. Okay. Um, in addition, in the US, we have Irvine, and this is off uh, New York in the Manhattan River. Um, this is a five meter diameter turbine. It's pilot mounted, and it's used yacht. It goes like this. And they put out six turbines, 200 kilowatt uh, array, in May of 2007, um, unfortunately, they were all taken offline for repair. Actually, something that I didn't say earlier is CGen also had a failure. They put it up and they had to uh, fix that problem. The reason is because the the comments said, like they just we, we just beef up a wind turbine, put it in water, and you hope that it works. Unfortunately, the fluid force is much higher. You also have boundary layer flow, the interaction, and and you can also have cavitation issue. So if you don't deal with them properly, you will have this kind of failure. Um, so the fifth generation of these designs are expected to be installed in later this year. So, um, so what are some challenges for a marine turbine compared to a wind application? One is, of course, you have higher hydrodynamic forces, so you have to think about the system strength, fatigue, vibration, and stability type of issues. Um, you also have bidirectional flow constantly, right? Flood and ebb tide, if you think about that. And interaction with the wave, with the bay telemetry, the best locations somewhere where you know you have a net, right? So you have good velocity in between, but um, but the but you have a you have three-dimensional uh, geometry, and you also have boundary layer flow, and etc. And so the spatial variation in flow is important, um, and potential and temporal as well. And you need active and potentially passive uh, blade pitch control mechanisms. A very important part is also harsh sea environment. It's corrosive if you have seawater, right? You can also have marine growth, that's on top of it. So once it starts on the leading edge, it significantly degrades your performance. Again, you can have degrees, you can have uh, um, seaweeds, and et cetera, 
and also you have vessel and ice impact. So, uh, for example, you know, even the, the Great Lakes um, offshore wind turbine project, they really worry about ice impact because the ice can be several feet thick. That's not a small one. So, and another thing that you have to worry about in water is hydrodynamic calculation. This is intermittent. And to show you what is typically, I think people are from every, all of us are from when boiling, that's with increasing temperature. Calculation is just via decrease in pressure. So the pressure, and that can happen in water if something is moving fast enough, such as at the tip of the blade. Okay? And when the pressure reduces to the liquid saturated vapor pressure of the fluid, um, what have calculation forms, and that's relatively benign, but it's what happens when it collapses. So you, this is a photograph, and so basically it forms a little microjet that impinges on the solid surface and it is in the order of like nanometers, and it, the velocity can be as high, it depends, it ranges somewhere between 200 to 900 meters per second. If you use it correctly, you can break up your kidney stones, like lithotripsy, okay, it's actually used, and you can use it to break up brain tumors. But, you can also cause significant damage if you don't <laughs> if you don't know how to control it. This is so if you look in the back of the boat, you see propellers and you see white areas on the blade, that's cavitation damage. Okay? Um, and in addition to um, causing uh, damage to the blade surface, causing vibration issues, noise. Noise is a significant problem. It also causes significance in thrust deduction and the torque. So this is when it's wetted, and this is when it's um, Trust coefficient, torque coefficient, and this is like the relative speed ratio if you think about that way. What happens is once it cavitates, the trust drops significantly. So what that means, so and the torque also drops significantly. So that has a huge impact on, for example, how much energy you can extract and for a marine propeller that also means all of a sudden you may your vessel will slow down, not because it's your choice. And so you can see how calculation looks like on the turbine. Um, this is on the model scale testing um, that was done uh, by Bajos. So next is how do we analyze and design these turbines? So typically you have the very common, and, and this is in design, um, in the, the industry use, very common is you can use uh, momentum uh, based theory, for example, the, the actuator does theory. And basically, it says uh, you assume one di dimensional flow and you account for this acceleration effect. Um, basically, it gives you the maximum, so the theoretical maximum extractable energy is 59.3%, and so called the density. Um, but of course, this you cannot use this to design the detail shape of your turbine. So, because it just gives you, it assumes everything to be uniform. To correct for that, there's so-called the blade element momentum theory, and basically it's just you add in two-dimensional lift and drag coefficients based on testing of simple cross sections, and then you just and then you add it to the momentum theory, and that's what's typically used in design today. The problem with this is two-dimensional, right? You don't account for any three-dimensional effect, and you don't account for the effect of spatial variation in flow. In wind applications, where it's sufficient, sufficiently far high above, your boundary, the variation of boundary layer may not be that significant where you have to worry about variations in that. Okay? In marine applications, you cannot, you have to account for the effect of spatial variation. Okay. Um, other type of method that can be used is so-called lifting line or lifting surface method. Um, so these are potential based methods, in another word, inviscid, rotational, and incompressible. And basically, to the lifting line is basically, you ignore the effect of variations in the port, and you just basically put sources or sinks to represent the effect of the presence of the body on the flow, okay? Um, Three-dimensional lifting surface method, basically, you account for the quirkwise variations on the blade, but you ignore the thickness effect of the blade. So, um, and these are very fast in the order of uh, seconds or less. But the problem is, if you have to worry about cavitation, or if you have to worry about flow separation, leading edge details are critical. So in order to capture leading edge detail, not flow separation yet, you can use a boundary element method. Basically, it places panel on the blade surface, so it accounts for that thickness effect intrinsically. And it's still very fast. Um, of course, it's still potential based, and this is what I will be talking about. So you place singularities on the on the surface of the blade as well as on the blade. So other method 
that can be used is, for example, CFD or computational fluid dynamics method. Um, you can use uh, RAM solvers, Raynor average neighbor Stokes equation. This simulation is from a large eddy type of simulation, or you can go to uh, detached eddy simulation or like uh, direct neighbor Stokes equation solver, but I haven't seen that yet. Um, so this is, it can be completely unsteady, uh, turbulent flow, but first of all, the problem is you have to mesh the fluid all around the heart. Okay, versus potential based method, I can, I can just mesh the surface around the heart, so change it from 3D to 2D. And second of all, you can see that huge mesh density that's required, and that's simply because you have to be able to capture the variation in boundary characteristics and the large scale. Uh, and um, this computation basically took by like one on a huge cluster. Okay, so versus a boundary element method, I can solve the problem in a minute. So you can see that for design purposes, you probably don't want to do this. Okay. So I'm sorry. What do you mean interpret this picture? So this is the mesh. So here is one of the clay, and here is the hub. This is the fluid element. This is showing you a detail of the of the. Uh, mesh, the computational mesh that you're using. And then this is the, this is, uh, you have the fluid velocity vectors, here's your play. And this is showing the ring vortex because uh, this is for, you, you, you don't use this method for design, but you need to use computational fluid method or viscous type method to account for off design conditions such as when you have large scale flow separation or when you have large scale ring vortices of weight. So you use it as a refine your computation, and that's what we do. So, but that's all on the fluid side only. That hasn't talked about what is the structural response. So, but the problem is excessive blade loads can lead into strength or fatigue issues. So, and they can interact with each other. And you can see from here, this is a wind turbine. And this is the current turbine, and you can see um, in the Manhattan River project, and you can see basically they have the same type of failure mechanism. So if you don't consider them properly, you won't have failure. Um, so how do we actually uh, model this then? I use uh, a couple um, boundary element method and finite element method approach because it's very fast. I can do the fully coupled calculation with fluid and with structure, uh, accounting for the structural performance and the variation in flow field uh, spatial variation in flow field, as well as the effect of calculation in the order of less than half an hour, for example. Okay? So how, how do you actually do that? Basically what you can do is, one of the critical tricks is that you have to be able to decompose to apply a potential method, you have to decompose the total velocity field into two parts, an effective inflow velocity and a potential velocity induced by the rotor. Why? Because potential based theory is inviscid, uh, incompressible, and irrotational. Viscous effect you can account for it using a drag coefficient, but it's rotating, right? So you can't say it's irrotational. So basically, what you do is the effective weight accounts for the vertical interaction between the propeller, between the rotor and the floor. Okay. So if I do that, then I can basically express the total. Uh, velocity is that inflow that accounts for the rotation part and <clears throat> uh, in the effective weight that's coming in, the variation, as well as the vertical interaction, the rotational velocity of, of the rotor, and then and then I can have the gradient, the perturbation potential. And that basically, um, then you can basically plug that in to the conservation of momentum and conservation of mass, and you solve that in the rotating coordinate system, so that's much faster, you don't need to prepare. Um, and because I, because I can convert this whole problem to be solving for the velocity potential, then I can basically, um, it's a potential based problem, and I can use it to solve the 3D, I can solve the uh, integral equation. Basically, this is what is so called the 3D boundary element method. So I, I solve, this is uh, two dimensional integration, right, over the surface of the blade as well as on the weight. And it's, it's an integral equation because you have B on both sides. So basically you have sources, you place source, sources to represent the thickness of the blade, as well as dipole to represent the effect of the lift. And then you also have source strengths to represent the cavity of the blade. So what you know is you have a wetted surface and then you have the cavitating part that's changing with time. So you have to figure out how that is changing. And then you also have the effect of the dipole strength of the blade to account for the Okay, 
So, and this is basically, um, the G is this one over R, for those of you who are familiar with it, and this is basically Kutta condition. The boundary condition, this is, and then you just basically solving for a mixed boundary value problem, because on the cavity surface, you know the pressure is constant, and you put a saturated vapor pressure. And on the wetted surface, you have the uh, no penetration boundary condition, so basically it's a Neumann type boundary condition. And then the, over here, you assume the weight strength to come back downstream, because in the heat of the So that's how you can solve this problem. But of course, there's an iteration process to figure out where does the cavity detaches, where does it close, and how that changes with time. So now that's the hydrodynamic side. On the structural side, to account for the effect of structural deformation, I can decompose the potential into another, into a part due to rigid blade rotation, and a part due to elastic blade vibration. And so, and similarly, I can show you um, how you can decompose the pressure to also a rigid blade component. This is basically Bernoulli's equation, and the elastic blade vibration part. And then you can apply the condition where the kinematic boundary condition where the um, velocity must equal between the fluid and the solid at the surface and the compatibility and pressure condition. And then you integrate the pressure due to elastic blade vibration over the surface of the blade. And if you do that properly, you can basically form an added mass matrix that's very different from traditional mass matrix, which is constant, it doesn't depend on, it doesn't depend on direction, this one depends on direction. So, and it's fully populated and it's asymmetric so you have an atom mass matrix times the acceleration, um, the nodal acceleration vector, and then you have a hydrodynamic damping matrix, um, and then you have the uh, uh, velocity vector. And then so you can add that to the structural mass matrix, structural damping matrix, and then here you have a structural stiffness, structural displacement, and on the right hand side, rigid blade pressure centrifugal force and coriolis force. So I solved this again in a rotating coordinate system. So this is just a simple OD, right? So, and you have the boundary condition that you assume the blades to be fixed at the root, and uh, you apply the pressure, you can solve for this. Just show you some validations. Um, again, I'm coming from the propeller side. I just wanna show you a more complicated case for a surface piercing propeller that actually cut the surface and come back up, okay? So this is a very complicated case. And I'm showing you the comparison of the measured, which are the symbols, versus the predicted, which are the lines, forces on the blade in the revolution. So when it's in air, there's no load. Once it touches the water, the load increases. Maximum, when it's at the maximum vertical position, and then it exits the water, and again, there's no load. Comparison of five components, because they have the five component dyno. And on the right-hand side is to show you the uh, so-called ventilation pattern. So here's the blade, and it draws air from the free surface. So you can see that it goes out like this. This is the observed, and this is the predicted. I plotted normal to the surface, so it's just plotting. But um, you can see that the ventilation pattern matches very closely with the, with the observed values. Okay. So this is, um, and this is a case where you have to worry about, this is for high-speed uh, high ship. So like if you want to do the James Bond one where you can travel at 200 knots, uh, this is what you use, okay? So, and for this type of propeller, you have to worry about vibration issues. You can see the formation of um, ringing behavior in the ventilated cavity here. And so, so um, for the, this set of experiment was done at Commonwealth. Um, and uh, you can see the comparison of the uh, dry frequency that's a measure in dots and the predicted is in the lines with the predicted and I did a grid convergence there. And then they also did a wet frequency calculation. These are difficult because the different uh, different blaze submergence can have a different added mass effect, and that effectively reduces your resonance frequency. So your resonance frequency in air in water is significantly decreases. So when you put something in water, you have to account for that because of the inertial effect of the water. You have to move the water around with it. And consequently, that reduces your vibration frequency and you have to worry about resonance. So that's just a simple validation. We have done plenty of other validations for composites that even self-deform, self-adapt. But next I want to show you validation for a turbine. And so I took the data from Baja et al. from, um, from their paper on renewable energy for a turbine tested inside a calculation tunnel. And so this is comparison of the power coefficient at two 
different group pitch angle. Um, so you have the 20 degree here and the 25 degree here. Uh, just as a function of tip speed ratio, the relative velocity between the axial and the tangential tip. And then you have a comparison between the uh, predicted, uh, which are the blue, dark blue symbols, and the measured, which are the open symbols. Um, they also observed cavitation in the tunnel, and then we predicted cavitation here, and so you can see the observed is continuous, it's just plotting. So you can see that uh, here's cavitation in this portion, and if you don't account for uh, cavitation, if you assume it's weather, you can see very different in pressure distribution. And consequently, that would have a different lift, or a different press. So we did the calculation for, okay, how about the real scenario where if you put it in water? So you see a lot of, everybody say, 20 meter diameter turbine. So we, we here's scale of the turbine, and I use the highest strength um, uh, metal metallic alloy that you can use that is actually millable. Anything higher than that is hard, difficult to mill. So is and this is also corrosion resistant, and you need that in water. So you can see the Young's modulus is very high, and the yield strength is also very high. And you put that, you assume a boundary layer flow characteristic, right? And I assume 20 meter in diameter. You have to have some clearance from the seabed, and you have to have some clearance from the free surface. That's what I assume. And you put that in the water, and you can calculate the, I can calculate the forces on each blade. And um, the difference between unsteady and steady calculation, typically you see out there, the actual thrust and the torque, not much difference. Steady calculation, though, however, cannot tell you the effect of the unbalanced blade load because of the different, because of the boundary layer, the spatial variation in the flow, because the load on the blade changes as it rotates. And that creates a high sign moment that if you were to do a steady calculation, you would not capture. So even for a mile boundary layer flow, the sign moment is about one third of the total. So if you don't design that properly, you will have some issue. Um, so if we put it in a scenario where, let's say, we have a variable, variable speed design so that it starts rotating here, and you can see that um, it picks up power here, this is the RPM um, on the left side, and this is the power. Uh, this is the theoretical bed limit, and this is, uh, no, this is just one half uh, rho v q, actually. And, and then this is uh, how much power you can actually extract based on the calculation. And so what I show you there is for the design condition, right? Beautiful. It works, that's fine. But what happened if you operate over here? Okay. So your flow, sometimes it can run into 3.5 meters per second. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So how would it perform? Even when it's rotating, let's say you kept, you use a, a, a pitch control, yaw control mechanism, something that's such that you usually pitch, that you can fix um, the uh, RPM to be, let's say, 14.32 uh, um, uh, uh, revolutions uh, per minute. The effect is, because now it's rotating, the loading is higher, near the surface, the pressure is lower, right? So you run into cavitation issues, okay? That's one thing. Another thing is, your deformation is 1.3 meters, even on, this, on the plate, okay? That's significant, that's not small. And the other thing is, your, stre your yield stress becomes very high. And so, I mean, your maximum by meter stress becomes very close to the yield stress. So, if you really want a 20 meter diameter turbine, you probably want to go something a little bit smaller. Um, so, so, so that's why you have to consider the effect of fluid structure and fraction. Now, yes, if you don't account for it properly, you can get dramatic failure. But you can also take advantage of fluid structure and fraction. And so their so-called a star turbine, is, uh, this is for wind, is sweep twisted adaptive rotor. So how that works is it takes advantage of bent twist coupling of composite. So if I have two different material with two different like um, uh, modulus, material stiffness, if I pull it, one will extend less than another, consequently I have a bending effect. Now if, you, if I layer that in an orthogonal direction, if I, under natural low, it bends, and it will cause a twist. So you have a passive pitch adaptation behavior that you can take advantage of, okay? And why would you, so why composite? Of course, one thing is it's lighter, for wind turbine is important, and you have higher specific stiffness.
But the fact that I just say is important because it allows you to do passive 3D shape adjustment that depends on the function of the boat. So you can have it to design to pitch to feather, or you can design to pitch to stall. And you don't need any actuators, particularly if you think about things that are very gigantic or the low is very high, you want passive. And when it's rotating, the load is changing at each position, you may not have some kind of actuation mechanism that can go faster. Okay, so it's nice to be passive. Um, and so the helicopter industry have been using that for improve the stability of the helicopter blades. Um, the picture that I showed is for this is you can improve the fatigue, and let me explain why. So beta here is the relative inflow, B is the in actual flow velocity. And the uh, omega r is the tangential flow velocity, right? So beta is the relative inflow angle, and B is the pitch angle, so alpha is your uh, uh, angle of attack, right? The simplest way. So if you just look at this equation very, very simply, you can see that the angle of attack increases as the velocity increases. So what you can do is we can design it to pitch the third. And what that means is you, the way that you design is at the design speed, you want your deformed pitch to match exactly with that of the rigid, okay? So this is the rigid one. So the green one is the deformed pitch of the self adapter You make it a match. So you have exactly the same performance, right? There's no difference in performance. Now, when it's off design, when the inflow velocity is less at very low velocity, you because the loading is less, the, uh, the increase in pitch um, or the decrease, sorry, the, the decrease in pitch becomes uh, uh, less, right? The change in pitch becomes less than at the design loading condition. Consequently, your pitch will become less than that of the rigid. So the rigid is the black line. Now you have this uh, 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 red line over here. And because of that, if you look at this equation, if this becomes less, your angle of attack becomes higher. What is the advantage of that? That means you can start earlier. Because your loading becomes higher, so it will start rotating. You can start earlier, that's the beauty. And then at high loading condition, when the velocity is high, the pitch will become higher than that of the rigid, and consequently the angle of tap becomes lower. So it helps you unload. And so you can avoid damage to your, not just the blades, but the nacelle and everything else. Okay, so here is what their study, and look at the fatigue too, because, because it can dynamically adjust the load by itself. And so the bent twist couple is the one in the solid line. The dashed line is without the coupling. And you can see that the stress amplitude is less. The fluctuation between points is less than that of the rigid. And that, if you think about fatigue, what, that's what matters, right? The, the stress ratio and the stress amplitude. And so this can help you um, increase the fatigue life of the structure. And it can also help you start a little bit earlier. So you have advantages in terms of what I just said. You can also, because it helps to alleviate low at um, high loading condition, you can avoid calcation. Um, but the challenge is you need to avoid resonance and divergence issue. So you can design it to pitch to feather in, in flow going this way, but it's the flow going other way. If you don't have some kind of pitch or yaw control mechanism, the loading will cause the loading to increase even further and you have um, divergence issue. And you also need to avoid material failure. Um, you have composite, now it's more difficult. And then you also may have to deal with deep stall conditions, okay? So, so an um, important thing that, although there is experience from the aerospace industry, in the aerospace and in wind turbine, you have a hollow architecture. So basically what I mean by that is you have a composite skin and you have like uh, spars over here to provide the structural strength because the goal is always make it as light as possible, right? Because the cost is so high. But in water, you can't do that because the loading is so high. So because the loading is so high, not only that you have to have a solid interior architecture, so this is a composite turbine, you can see that it's solid laminated throughout. In addition, the shape of it has to be different. The leading edge detail is very critical to avoid calculation and to have good flow separation behavior. The Reynolds number is different. And also because of the different loading, you can see the blade tend to be fatter and you want it to have some skew and you want it to, so, so you can see there's a good reason why. So like in wind turbine, majority of the time, people just use two dimensional calculations for both the, the hydrodynamic side and the structural side. You can do that, 
because it's linear, it's a slight beam. In water, unfortunately, you can't do that. Okay, it's very three dimensional. So now, the, finally, I want to end up with talking about what are some current opportunities and challenges. So um, what I just say applies for marine turbine. You can see the same calculation can be used for wind turbine because you just don't have calculation, right? It's still rotating slow enough such that the compressibility is true. But U.S. currently leads the world in land-based wind energy capacity, but there's no offshore wind turbine. Um, there's 20 projects in plan, but, um, and there's some change in management issues. So, but Europe is currently the leader in offshore wind turbine. The biggest being um, Denmark over here and UK. UK is actually the biggest, though, so the most advanced technology is coming from UK. You can see that US is nowhere on the screen, but China is here. So, um, and the amount of steel that is put in the water is dramatic. It's bigger than the amount of steel that was put in the water because of the oil. The, if, you talk to, if you talk to Boeing, the wind turbine industry is using so much composite that is driving the composite price up. It's more than what you use for planes. Okay? So that's the basic statistic. So there are 830 plus turbines installed already, offshore wind turbines that's already connected to the grid. It generates 2,300 megawatts. Okay? Um, and they plan to add another 1,000 megawatts. And this last year, I got the report from 2010, and they're going to add another 50,000. More. So you can see the market there, but there are significant challenges. Currently, we're so you can see this is land, and here's deep water. Critical, critical issue. Rather, if you talk about large-scale offshore wind turbine or marine turbine, is the foundation. So you can see that majority of the experience over here is is in shallow water, less than 30 meters deep. Um, so we typically use gravity-based foundations. And the type of gravity-based foundation dependent on soil type. You have rock, you have like soft mud, etc. Anything deeper than that, it becomes so expensive that you need to use some other type of foundation mechanism. And when you really get into deep water, like the one that they have, if you want really massive scale farm, then you have to end up, you need some kind of more. And so you can borrow technology from the offshore side because that's that's what is being used. Okay. So and why do we want it? Why do we want offshore? First of all, you have higher wind speed, and then also you can have larger turbine diameter, and you can rotate faster because you don't have to worry about noise issues, you don't have people on the land complaining, right? Um, but because you, to make it offshore, the initial investment cost is so expensive because you need to have specialized vessels to go out there to install your turbine. Okay, so you have to drill the foundation, put the put the pile on, and then and then also one of the advantage of winter of, of offshore is that you don't have the land-based limitation of the size. It can be larger because now you can install everything on site. Just ship it, and the shipping capacity is much greater than your car capacity. So that that's a significant difference. But that also means you need specialized vessel, and you also need underwater high-powered underwater cables to deliver. Because of all these factors and the high cost and time of permitting and license issues, all of these drive that it only makes sense if you do really large scale and if you do a farm. So if you look at here's the rotor size and cost per megawatt, this is the turbine cost, and these are the other factors come in. Basically, they drive that. In order to make it economical, you need to have large turbines. And so that's, that's the driving factor. And basically what they're proposing now is uh, 150 meter in diameter, just for the turbine itself. So you can get a sense of that size. It's gigantic. Um, in U.S., there are places that make sense. Of course, mostly near the coastline. So this is the blue. Uh, the uh, light blue is the sh uh, shallow water. Um, uh, regular blue is uh, intermediate depth, and then and then this this is um, deeper water. So deeper water, you have other issues. So Basically, this is the gigawatt by depth capacity that we have in the U.S. Um, and this is assuming that you can have a 5 megawatt wind turbine, every offshore wind turbine every kilometer square. But of course, setting issue and everything else reduced it by 60%. And so you may ask, why does it make sense? You have to look at the cost of electricity in coastal regions. The cost of electricity, for example, here's Hawaii, and here's New York. 
And <laughs> the cost of electricity in the coastal region, which are the blue one, compared to the inland, which are the green one, tend to be higher in coastal region. Also in coastal region, except for some states, you may not have accessibility to wind, good wind, like large land space for wind turbine. Um, so so um, that's, and since the cost of electricity is already so high, you can see that the mean is 9.9 cents per kilowatt hour. So Hawaii is almost like 28 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, it's much higher. So now you look at how much cost does it cost for offshore wind turbine or marine turbine. So land-based turbine, um, I, it's the, the currently this is a, a, a um, this is based on a report in 2010. More recently, you see more numbers like about 4.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Offshore is about 11 to 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, the capital cost is very high um, because in, in this study. Um, it varies a lot, depends on if you have deep water or shallow water and how challenging are the soil condition. And so it can vary somewhere between 2,000 to 7,000, but the mean is somewhere around $4,000 uh, uh, $4, per kilowatt. Okay? Um, and assume, but this assumes huge farm capacity, like in the order of hundreds to um, gigawatts, right? 100 megawatts of gigawatts. Tidal turbine that have been studied, this is for the based on CGEN. Um, they reported that it's about the cost of energy is about nine to eighteen cents per kilowatt hour, with a mean of somewhere between twelve to fifteen cents per kilowatt. Hour. <coughs> so you can see that in the offshore side that makes sense, particularly if you think about the projected rate of increase that you won't have for the cost of electricity. But the capital cost is still very high. But you can see that with offshore wind and marine turbine, they're around they're comparable. And that's why you have people that invest in, in this area. So challenges. There's still a lot of issues to deal with. The problem is you have the wind condition. You can have storm, by the way. One of the damage mechanisms to large-scale turbines, even when they're composite, is lightning. It's actually, uh, they show me an example where they burn a whole tree, the turbine, right? Believe it or not. And then you have problems with the nacelle, and you have significant problems with the power transmission. Um, this, uh, those issues need to be resolved. And then you can, the place where we have, like, expect a lot of wind, good wind, where you're going to put it in, and good current, chances are those also the places where you can have extreme events, right? You can have extreme hurricanes, or you can have, like, tsunami. And um, in West Coast, you can also have earthquake. So now how you go to design, um, how you go to design the mooring system, the foundation system, and how you go to design the, the support structure, and also, you can have marine growth. This is an example. This is what I meant by marine growth. The effect is, if this is on your blade, this is why the U.S. Navy sends divers there to clean the blade. Um, so it's not simple, okay? And then also um, ice that may happen. And uh, and another thing that you have to consider is the lifetime variability in the operating condition. So this is from CGEN. Um, what this shows is basically this is the tidal current histogram over, um, so the chance of, so how do you, the design decision, you have to think about it, that they designed it to be cut in by about 0.7 meters per second, and they, the uh, rated speed is about 2.5, but you can see this is about their most frequent, over here you cap it, right? So you have to think about the lifetime, what is the optimal, because this is a design decision. If you were to shift it by a little bit, your lifetime extracted energy potential is different. Okay, based on, and how that would change if you don't properly maintain it, for example, if you have secret around your plate. And the, have, can, consequently, something that's optimized for one condition will not be optimized for another. And also, life cycle cost, right? So, so uh, for, um, for offshore wind, Douglas actually did a life cycle analysis, so you have to consider the raw material generation, including all the composites and stuff, and that's a huge component, and then the, the transportation. And then if you do offshore wind, you have to, um, this is actually for sea gen, sorry. Um, the, you have to think about the specialized vessel that you need to go out there to install it, the, the carbon dioxide that's spent because of that, and then the disposal of the waste, so the whole uh, cradle to grave. Um, uh, generation, and you can see here is the part that I took from took from um, offshore wind, actually, from the NRBL report, and they reported several different authors on the life cycle analysis. 
the turbine itself, and of course that includes all the other components, is the bloom part. The, is, you can see it is a significant component, but what else is a significant component is here is um, your electrical infrastructure in the green, the, uh, the blue is your support structure, and red is your operation and maintenance costs. You can see, depends on the different estimates, the operation and maintenance costs can dominate. And they design typically for 20 years or 25 years. Okay. So, so if you don't, if you don't think about, for example, the C gen that I show you, they have it on their cycle that every every half year they go out and maintain the plane. And every so often they also have to, um, uh, they have to send out a bigger vessel to do a bigger regular maintenance. If not, you won't have, particularly when you have pitch control, because you can have C growth around the joints and then it wouldn't work anymore. So. Um, so you have to worry about all these issues. So basically, in order to truly design for something, what you really need is a probabilistic system-based design approach. We talk about the mechanics of it. So I talk about the hydrodynamics and structure dynamics of the blade in particular. So, um, but you have a lot of other components that you have, you know, including the foundation and the su and support system. So you, we talk about fluid structure interaction analysis, design and optimization, but you have to look at the whole system response. Because how that the, the resonance frequency of the whole system for it, with the mooring can be significantly different without the mooring. Because it's different set up if without the with the mooring that if you don't consider it properly, for example, if you have a tsunami wave that can completely wipe it out. But if you design it 20 years, you you know, tsunami doesn't happen that often, then it may be okay, but it's just how much you invest in it. Um, interaction with surroundings. Active and passive control strategy, for example, if you do active pitch control, how do you design it such that adaptively um, you can maximize your energy harvest by pitching, by having that control mechanism. You have to worry about the time here, obviously, and the expense. And, and, and the sensor and the control, that means you need sensor and control networks in order to do that, but so that you can sense what is the environmental operating condition, the uh, flow velocity, then you can adjust it properly in direction. But that also tend to um, degrade the facets. Like let's and and so there's one of the reports from uh, NREL um, from 2008, I believe, um, and those have a lifetime of like five years, and then you need to change it, right? So and then um, um, you can. But also the other huge issue is also energy conversion, storage, and distribution. You talk by generators or transformers, the power aggregation, the the change in the, you have to change the frequency and then you have to distribute all the power aggregated and how do you match that the supply with the demand i mean the, so you have all these power but how do you match with the demand of the customers in terms of when you need power how specific is this to whether or not it's a wind turbine versus wind it's it's wind and offshore wind wind is not as predictable so is so like wind is more much more stochastic Tidal is much more predictable. So you can design the lifes that you know when you don't have the energy, assuming that all your turbines are. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's why they're different. But that's why you need a true systems approach, and that's why it's so appropriate here, is that you need to consider all the components in order to improve the system performance, reliability, safety, and robustness, so that you can reduce the total ownership cost. So, thank you.
way to do slides. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, sorry, I only have that for a power. Um, so this is for water or for? This is for water. But this so is it's more difficult for water than for air. Correct. And also, when you have cavitation, it's more right. like this. You can't use a single base flow. And so what is, particularly the type of condition that you worry about when you have massive uh, flow separation, as well as um, uh, like uh, turbulent weight states or vortex rain when we have the, right. those conditions, RANS methods will not be able to capture because trans, those are dominated by large scale transient vortices. And to do those, you need large eddy simulation, for example. Right. I mean, they become more expensive, but large eddy simulation, um, that means you don't care about the local boundary layer characteristics because that becomes relatively smaller. Um, because that impact is smaller, so you can use a coarse grain, otherwise it's... So let's say I give you all that. Yes. I do that. There, there, are methods, there are methods designed when it's clean and everything is sort of... Uh, have to what happens if I start getting, you know, things that they lay on the turbine and, and I have perturbations? So how, how predictable calculations are there, for example? Because in order to understand the maintenance schedule and all that, you have to understand... Correct. So you have to redo the calculation with some bounds. So, yes, for different roughness, because right. that trips the turbulence differently. So, so how advanced is that? How, how much do you have in terms of control? That is, uh, so like you can, what you can do is very similar to what you can do in model scale experiments. What do you do in model scale experiments? Because, for example, if, for things that you worry about wave conditions, it's important to scale with respect to fruit number, not Reynolds number. Unfortunately, these are dominated by Reynolds number in fact. I mean, if you talk about the off-scale, like these flow separation and all these. So what you do to simulate like the same Reynolds number that you have in full scale, you can add sand strips to trip it, okay? So that, that's what you can do uh, experimentally, such that you can produce the same turbulent, rain, the same Reynolds number. Numerically, you can do the same thing. You can add roughness elements to, you know, you can account for that, add that roughness to represent the effect of the Reynolds number on the surface. That's a quick and dirty way to do it. Of course, you want the more true way to do it. That's going to cost but you. people have, there are facilities where you go between the experiments with the calculations and back and forth. Yes, yes. Because you can see for both, uh, for both uh, turbines as well as for propellers, for example, um, marine turbines in particular, you can test it in, you can test it in the calculation tunnel. Wind turbines, on the other hand, you don't care about gravitational impacts, right? That, that varies. So you just need a wind, wind tunnel facility so that you can match the Reynolds number. You don't care about the number. You don't care about the, so that you can simulate the same turbulent condition because you worry about this this impacts. So it depends on what you're looking for. And sometimes for some of the test cases, you actually need a combination of, you need two different set of tests. So like even for some ships, you have people that, you, um, from, you have Carteract, right, that you have the towing facility and those for gravity base, but you can also put the same, same hull on a wind tunnel and to look at, but then that you cannot capture the impact of the wave, right? So you can do two sets of tests to get both emissions so that at least, or you can do step up to project what is the effect on the blue scale. But then, okay, you do all these for rigid, you know, then if you do the adaptive, and if you do the adaptive, you better design, you know, it's particularly, um, you have to make sure that the material response scales that properly. In addition, you have to make sure that the rate of change relative to the rate of flow excitation is exactly the same thing, or else you're not going to get the same response. And the resonance, the system resonance frequency. One typical example is like if you think about a board structure, okay? So so all these, you know, for deep offshore, you, go, you need to moor, right? Or even heat tank device. Unfortunately, most of the water tanks are limited in depth. So, right? So like you can have three meter, five meter, even 10 meter, let's say. So Shanghai has one of these nearest facility with a deep cut in the middle. In other places, you don't have the advantage of that. So that limits your length scale because that dictates your length scale because it does impact the resonance frequency. So we did analysis for a heat pipe device. So if you're, but you don't want to be too small because then you can't get all the dynamics right. Particularly if you do adaptive, then you can't design something small enough such that I do that. What you do is you can add weights into the in so like there's your to some like such that you match the you match for example you worry about the heat frequency because if you worry
worry about this type of excitation. You match the heat frequency with the same system. You're, you may have some differences in the couple pitch and surge frequency, but you say that's okay because that, and you can do a numerical simulation to do the full scale. So as long as you have something that you can match with, with your numerical, uh, then you can use your numerical to do the scale analysis. And the other question I have is, where do you talk about how can we calculate the heat? I'm sorry? Where do you calculate the heat so you can actually uh, predict where the brain can be? So, with, with, um, with steel, that's easier because steel with the fatigue behavior is more well characterized. Is, isn't the fatigue related to the bending? The, you mean the pole? The blade is going to bend. Yes, yes, yes. Or, and then you bend back because of the bias of so, the structures. So, where do you calculate that to make sure that when you do your design, you can predict? We have. For composite, we have only started in that area because there isn't a good. Um, there won't be Actually, that, that was my question. It won't be just the frequency, right? I, all, so I, I, I understand um, uh, where do I have that. I, 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 so, like, basically, what you can do is I, sorry, I don't have that slide in here. Um, I had it in another, in, I, I had it in a. In, a, in, in, a, in another presentation, but what you can do is you can, if you put in a weight flow, you can calculate what is the mean stress, and you can calculate what is the stress ratio, the positive to negative. And then there are some test data, for example, for glass fibers that has uh, MSU, I think, right, that have done some nice testing. Oh, they, um, uh, is MSU, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it Michigan State? Is it um, another one? Um, for, the, so uh, for there are some test data for at least for wind turbine type of for large uh, marine turbine uh, turbine that done uh, tests in marine turbine not any published material I can find so I can do I can like they can give out the you, you know the, um, uh, the strength degradation but what we have done is we have looked at Richard, do you understand understand how I can break a wind turbine by changing the control scheme because there was an attack like that, right? When the power generator spin, they yes. made the controller go crazy and you got a picture like the one you saw where the turbine that broke pieces. Yes. But that's an attack on, on, the, on the controller of the, of the power generation to yes. destroy the, uh, the turbine. Okay, so so do, do, we, do we have good understanding in terms of input power? Like if I try to do some crazy control value with the turbine, how do I destroy it because for the wind one? For the, for the marine it's different, right? Do I understand the fatigue analysis so I can do the maintenance? Well, with, with the fatigue analysis, what we have done is, let's say I, I assume that this is, I know how the stiffness and as well as, um, as, well as how the, the stiffness actually doesn't matter that much, it's the strength degradation. If I know how the strength degrades with number of cycles, then I can calculate over the life. But the key is having, because once you have that, you can do the calculation on the analysis. That's not an issue. And you can know what is the operational profile. But the key is having that data, because on the marine side, that's being tested. But the problem is that you don't want to make it too heavy, because I can beat it up and make it. Yes. But if I beat it, beat, beat it up, then it becomes not very high performance. So that's why it's a difficult problem. Yes, it's a very challenging problem. This is what we're working on now. It's, it's, and, and also, like, there are other methods where you can add in components like spar components of the, oh. but then you worry about stress concentration. So the material is not uniform. Exactly. 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 So so you can take advantage of those. But also in terms of like in terms of experimental testing, if you worry about attacks, um, either in air and in water, you can simulate you know the type of the type of uh, motion that you will have. In addition, you can, like, very common in the, they actually, if you look at a picture of uh, NREL testing of this of the star turbine, basically they have one blade, it's cantilevers, hole at one end, and they literally weight buckets. Oh. <laughs> I mean, um, literally, I'm not kidding. Well, it's, it's linear, right? It's not a beam. So that you can do different modes and you can see how that changes. Oh, but, <laughs> so for, for marine propeller application, we have done, like, similar uh, underwater explosion, where would the explosion cause the most damage, for example? Um, but but composites is much more difficult, mainly because and and I have some other slide not here, but I can show that to you um, uh, uh, later on if you want. Um, the problem with composite is that the strength, the, the stiffness you can you can there's not much the variation in strength 
is significant. It can be plus minus 20%. Um, and that's because there's a size effect. The bigger it is, you have more variability. You can have a voice, for example. And, it also, and, and also, how do you manufacture it? How do you wrap the ends? Right? And what is the effect of long-term seawater immersion on the, on the strength of the material? So because of the variation in strength is so, so large, and almost all the, all the Fabry models that we have out there are empirically based. So they typically use quadratic based Fabry models. I have a slide somewhere here. Um, so, but you have many different Fabry mechanisms. So for example, so for example, here's the Fabry laws that um, um, you can have like tensile failure, you, you can uh, have fiber failure, but that's not very common because these are like effectively loaded. The most common ones are actually matrix failure and delamination. So you can have tensile matrix cracking because the resin behavior effectively governs everything. So right now the trick, what the, what, um, it, that's why it's a collaboration with uh, material companies where they can do testing. Do you and know what technique they use to coat this huge blades? Um, that's that's another issue. So so for example, to 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 combat the effect of of marine growth, like in the navy, they just use coal, right? right? So but they but the problem is, you know, it's the if you have a very effective coating that um, uh, it's a balance between how much the the most effective coating you have coating that will work for a long time and. But the problem is they they uh, they uh, um, the, the the impact on the environment. Okay, for even for wind turbine or for helicopter blades, um, they have a special coating to avoid the damage due to sandblasting. And basically, they keep painting it. Now in water, unfortunately, you go contaminate the thing, especially if it works for a long time. So it's a so. And in addition, if you have to worry about captation, because the captation erosion on composite on the coating yes. is currently an issue what we're working on now. And, and that's not Absolutely. simple. And, and experimental testing is not that easy because typically you do experimental testing that, you know, okay, yeah, they, they basically you create a situation where cavitation bubble forms and then, and then you know, how fast it, it uh, creates that pit, right? But that's not considering that now if the, if, if the thing, you know, for a turbine at least is not operating that fast, but if you have a marine propeller, you know, that thing can be, uh, you know, it's traveling, it's, it's bidding like two, 300 RPM, and it's traveling at 40 knots. And if that's the case, <laughs> your ping will be roll much faster. <laughs> so that's what we're working on now. That, those are some of the issues. So I, I didn't get the chance to touch on these side of the issues, but I'm glad that you asked the question. Thank you. The last question I have yeah. is very difficult. Yeah. So I, and I've started by telling my position so you can thank me. I don't believe that if one does total total ownership of the quality systems in the end for uh, offshore wind, including the transmission costs and the life cycle, life cycle but including the removal of the junk after the machine is junk, that this is better than you get in the end. Um, that's why I don't make a statement because the people have made all kinds of noise over the last two months and we're going to have them coming here. And the numbers I've seen, the cost per kilowatt, total cost,
And then you ask. This is small. This this jump after is bigger problem. Suppose one of these things get destroyed in the middle of it, it, because I've seen them. I flew over in Sweden I, I five, uh, five times a year, and I've seen them on both sides of the straits, right there, big farms. Two or three things get destroyed. How do you how do you clean up? The, uh, because you see, you live there. Then? No, actually. And you know that in Shanghai, but not in Europe. That's not true. <laughs> There, there is a, even for, for a, there is a new Sorry, vessel. I have a link that I can give you later. There's a, there's a major vessel that they have designed that, um, the same thing that you have for the um, offshore uh, oil drilling platform. Yes, so, so now a lot, you have a lot of them, you have a lot of them out there. And you have a, and they are not, no longer there to extract all the oil, so they just want to leave it there. So they basically say, can I just leave it here? And of course the government say, no, 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 you can't do that. And so like they say, can I just cut off the pot? No, 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 you can't just, no, literally, I'm not kidding. So, <laughs> so, so, and then, so now there's a huge vessel that has been designed that basically what it does is it has a mechanical arm like this, supposed to pull the whole thing out. But the design of that vessel is, because what happened if something happens such that it snap? That low on your vessel is tremendous. There are some folks in Australia that they gave me the following story, so I will pass by you and I'll finish here. They said that for all this offshore drilling and uh, the wind turbines and all that stuff, you can actually design the understructure, the structure in such a way that if you leave it in the sea, it becomes like a natural habitat. And they yes. four hours pick it up. Yes. Do you read that? Um, uh, <laughs> I haven't so looked at more environmental friendly, they say that people. Uh, I, I, I heard about those, and, and but those also tend to be massive, tend yeah. to be bigger. What do you need massive for to create some sort of erotic kind of environment where fish will come and eat and corals and grow and so on? So, what do you need to be massive? But, of course, you cannot do too many of them. The, the problem is if you go, if you look at the map, So what, suppose there are 500 windows, suppose, even, I don't know, you want 500 yet? I don't know, it's going to start getting into the problem. I agree that it's an issue, and, and, but you, there are life cycle analysis that have been done, but those... But there, there are several... Uh, but it depends on what numbers you use. Yeah. There are several books have been here in Europe that they already have warned that the interest in offshore 